Chapter 7, Part D of The Wealth of Nations, Book 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Book 4, Chapter 7, Part D of Colonies. Part 3 of the advantages which europe has derived from the discovery of america and from that of a passage to the east indies by the cape of good hope such are the advantages which the colonies of america have derived from the policy of europe what are those which europe has derived from the discovery and colonization of america those advantages may be divided first into the general advantages which europe considered as one great country has derived from those great events and secondly into the particular advantages which each colonizing country has derived from the colonies which particularly belong to it in consequence of the authority or dominion which it exercises over them the general advantages which europe considered as one great country has derived from the discovery and colonization of america consist first in the increase of its enjoyments and secondly in the augmentation of its industry the surplus produce of america imported into europe furnishes the inhabitants of this great continent with a variety of commodities which they could not otherwise have possessed some for conveniency and use some for pleasure and some for ornament and thereby contributes to increase their enjoyments the discovery and colonization of america it will readily be allowed have contributed to augment the industry first of all the countries which trade to it directly such as spain portugal france and england and secondly of all those which without trading to it directly send through the medium of other countries goods to it of their own produce such as austrian flanders and some provinces of germany which through the medium of the countries before mentioned send to it a considerable quantity of linen and other goods all such countries have evidently gained a more extensive market for their surplus produce and must consequently have been encouraged to increase its quantity but those great events should likewise have contributed to encourage the industry of countries such as hungary and poland which may never perhaps have sent a single commodity of their own produce to america is not perhaps altogether so evident that those events have done so however cannot be doubted some part of the produce of america is consumed in hungary and poland and there is some demand there for the sugar chocolate and tobacco of that new quarter of the world but those commodities must be purchased with something which is either the produce of the industry of hungary and poland or with something which had been purchased with some part of that produce those commodities of america are new values new equivalents introduced into hungary and poland to be exchanged there for the surplus produce of those countries by being carried thither they create a new and more extensive market for that surplus produce they raise its value and thereby contribute to encourage its increase though no part of it may ever be carried to america it may be carried to other countries which purchase it with a part of their share of the surplus produce of america and it may find a market by means of the circulation of that trade which was originally put into motion by the surplus produce of america those great events may even have contributed to increase the enjoyments and to augment the industry of countries which not only never sent any commodities to america but never received any from it even such countries may have received a greater abundance of other commodities from countries of which the surplus produce had been augmented by means of the american trade this greater abundance as it must necessarily have increased their enjoyments so it must likewise have augmented their industry a greater number of new equivalents of some kind or other must have been presented to them to be exchanged for the surplus produce of that industry a more extensive market must have been created for that surplus produce so as to raise its value and thereby encourage its increase the mass of commodities annually thrown into the great circle of european commerce and by its various revolutions annually distributed among all the different nations comprehended within it must have been augmented by the whole surplus produce of america a greater share of this greater mass therefore is likely to have fallen to each of those nations to have increased their enjoyments and augmented their industry the exclusive trade of the mother countries tends to diminish 
or at least to keep down below what they would otherwise rise to, both the enjoyments and industry of all those nations in general, and of the American colonies in particular. It is a dead weight upon the action of one of the great springs which puts into motion a great part of the business of mankind. By rendering the colony produce dearer in all other countries, it lessens its consumption, and thereby cramps the industry of the colonies, and both the enjoyments and the industry of all other countries, which both enjoy less when they pay more for what they enjoy, and produce less when they get less for what they produce. By rendering the produce of all other countries dearer in the colonies, it cramps in the same manner the industry of all other colonies, and both the enjoyments and the industry of the colonies. It is a clog which, for the supposed benefit of some particular countries, embarrasses the pleasures and encumbers the industry of all other countries, but of the colonies more than of any other. It not only excludes as much as possible all other countries from one particular market, but it confines as much as possible the colonies to one particular market, and the difference is very great between being excluded from one particular market when all others are open, and being confined to one particular market when all others are shut up. The surplus produce of the colonies, however, is the original source of all that increase of enjoyments and industry which Europe derives from the discovery and colonization of America and the exclusive trade of the mother countries tends to render this source much less abundant than it otherwise would be. The particular advantages which each colonizing country derives from the colonies which particularly belong to it are of two different kinds. First, those common advantages which every empire derives from the provinces subject to its dominion, and, secondly, those peculiar advantages which are supposed to result from provinces of so very peculiar a nature as the european colonies of america the common advantages which every empire derives from the provinces subject to its dominion consist first in the military force which they furnish for its defence and secondly in the revenue which they furnish for the support of its civil government the roman colonies furnished occasionally both the one and the other the Greek colonies sometimes furnished a military force, but seldom any revenue. They seldom acknowledged themselves subject to the dominion of the mother city. They were generally her allies in war, but very seldom her subjects in peace. The European colonies of America have never yet furnished any military force for the defense of the mother country. The military force has never yet been sufficient for their own defense and in the different wars in which the mother countries have been engaged the defence of their colonies has generally occasioned a very considerable distraction of the military force of those countries in this respect therefore all the european colonies have without exception been a cause rather of weakness than of strength to their respective mother countries the colonies of spain and portugal only have contributed any revenue towards the defence of the mother country or the support of her civil government the taxes which have been levied upon those of other european nations upon those of england in particular have seldom been equal to the expense laid out upon them in time of peace and never sufficient to defray that which they occasioned in time of war such colonies therefore have been a source of expense and not of revenue to their respective mother countries the advantages of such colonies to their respective mother countries consist altogether in those peculiar advantages which are supposed to result from provinces of so very peculiar a nature as the european colonies of america and the exclusive trade it is acknowledged is the sole source of all those peculiar advantages in consequence of this exclusive trade all that part of the surplus produce of the english colonies for example which consists in what are called enumerated commodities can be sent to no other country but england other countries must afterwards buy it of her it must be cheaper therefore in england than it can be in any other country and must contribute more to increase the enjoyments of england than those of any other country it must likewise contribute more to encourage her industry for all those parts of her own surplus produce which england exchanges for those enumerated commodities she must get a better price than any other countries can get for the like parts of theirs when they exchange them for the same commodities the manufacturers of england for example will purchase a greater quantity of the sugar and tobacco of her own colonies than the like manufacturers of other countries can purchase of that sugar and tobacco 
So far, therefore, as the manufactures of England and those of other countries are both to be exchanged for the sugar and tobacco of the English colonies, this superiority of price gives an encouragement to the former beyond what the latter can, in these circumstances, enjoy. The exclusive trade of the colonies, therefore, as it diminishes, or at least keeps down below what they would otherwise rise to, both the enjoyments and the industry of the countries which do not possess it, so it gives an evident advantage to the countries which do possess it over those other countries. This advantage, however, will, perhaps, be found to be rather what may be called a relative than an absolute advantage, and to give a superiority to the country which enjoys it, rather by depressing the industry and produce of other countries, than by raising those of that particular country above what they would naturally rise to in the case of a free trade. The tobacco of Maryland and Virginia, for example, by means of the monopoly which England enjoys of it, certainly comes cheaper to England than it can do to France, to whom England commonly sells a considerable part of it. But had France and all other European countries been at all times allowed a free trade to Maryland and Virginia, the tobacco of those colonies might by this time have come cheaper than it actually does, not only to all those other countries, but likewise to England. The produce of tobacco, in consequence of a market so much more extensive than any which it has hitherto enjoyed, might, and probably would, by this time have been so much increased as to reduce the profits of a tobacco plantation to their natural level with those of a corn plantation, which it is supposed they are still somewhat above. The price of tobacco might, and probably would, by this time, have fallen somewhat lower than it is at present. An equal quantity of the commodities, either of England or of those other countries, might have purchased in Maryland and Virginia a greater quantity of tobacco than it can do at present, and consequently have been sold there for so much a better price. So far as that weed, therefore, can by its cheapness and abundance increase the enjoyments or augment the industry, either of England or of any other country, it would probably, in the case of a free trade, have produced both these effects in somewhat a greater degree than it can do at present. England, indeed, would not, in this case, have had any advantage over other countries. She might have bought the tobacco of her colonies somewhat cheaper, and consequently have sold some of her own commodities somewhat dearer than she actually does. But she could neither have bought the one cheaper, nor sold the other dearer, than any other country might have done. She might perhaps have gained an absolute, but she would certainly have lost a relative advantage. In order, however, to obtain this relative advantage in the colony trade, in order to execute the invidious and malignant project of excluding, as much as possible, other nations from any share in it, England, there are very probable reasons for believing, has not only sacrificed a part of the absolute advantage which she, as well as every other nation, might have derived from that trade, but has subjected herself both to an absolute and to a relative disadvantage in almost every other branch of trade. When, by the act of navigation, England assumed to herself the monopoly of the colony trade, the foreign capitals which had before been employed in it were necessarily withdrawn from it. The English capital, which had before carried on but a part of it, was now to carry on the whole. The capital which had before supplied the colonies with but a part of the goods which they wanted from Europe, was now all that was employed to supply them with the whole. But it could not supply them with the whole and the goods with which it did supply them were necessarily sold very dear. The capital which had before bought but a part of the surplus produce of the colonies was now all that was employed to buy the whole. But it could not buy the whole at anything near the old price, and therefore whatever it did buy it necessarily bought very cheap. But in an employment of capital, in which the merchant sold very dear and bought very cheap, the profit must have been very great, and much above the ordinary level of profit in other branches of trade. This superiority of profit in the colony trade could not fail to draw from other branches of trade a part of the capital which had before been employed in them. But this revulsion of capital, as it must have gradually increased the competition of capitals in the colony trade, so it must have gradually diminished that competition in all those other branches of trade. As it must have gradually lowered the profits of the one, so it must have gradually raised those of the other, till the profits of all came to a new level, different from and somewhat higher than that at which they had been before. 
This double effect of drawing capital from other trades, and of raising the rate of profit somewhat higher than it otherwise would have been in all trades, was not only produced by this monopoly upon its first establishment, but has continued to be produced by it ever since. First, this monopoly has been continually drawing capital from all other trades to be employed in that of the colonies. Though the wealth of Great Britain has increased very much since the establishment of the act of navigation, it certainly has not increased in the same proportion as that of the colonies. But the foreign trade of every country naturally increases in proportion to its wealth, its surplus produce in proportion to its whole produce. And Great Britain, having engrossed to herself almost the whole of what may be called the foreign trade of the colonies, and her capital not having increased in the same proportion as the extent of that trade, she could not carry it on without continually withdrawing from other branches of trade some part of the capital which had before been employed in them, as well as withholding from them a great deal more which would otherwise have gone to them. Since the establishment of the act of navigation, accordingly, the colony trade has been continually increasing, while many other branches of foreign trade, particularly of that to other parts of Europe, have been continually decaying. Our manufactures for foreign sale, instead of being suited, as before the act of navigation, to the neighboring market of Europe, or to the more distant one of the countries which lie around the Mediterranean Sea, have the greater part of them been accommodated to the still more distant one of the colonies to the market in which they have the monopoly, rather than to that in which they have many competitors. The causes of decay in other branches of foreign trade, which, by Sir Matthew Decker and other writers, have been sought for in the excess and improper mode of taxation, in the high price of labor, in the increase of luxury, etc., may all be found in the overgrowth of the colony trade. The mercantile capital of Great Britain, though very great, yet not being infinite, and though greatly increased since the act of navigation, yet not being increased in the same proportion as the colony trade, that trade could not possibly be carried on without withdrawing some part of that capital from other branches of trade, nor consequently without some decay of those other branches. England, it must be observed, was a great trading country. Her mercantile capital was very great, and likely to become still greater and greater every day not only before the act of navigation had established the monopoly of the corn trade, but before that trade was very considerable. In the Dutch war, during the government of Cromwell, her navy was superior to that of Holland, and in that which broke out in the beginning of the reign of Charles the Second, it was at least equal, perhaps superior, to the united navies of France and Holland. Its superiority, perhaps, would scarce appear greater in the present times, at least if the Dutch navy were to bear the same proportion to the Dutch commerce now which it did then. But this great naval power could not, in either of those wars, be owing to the act of navigation. During the first of them, the plan of that act had been but just formed, and though, before the breaking out of the second, it had been fully enacted by legal authority, yet no part of it could have had time to produce any considerable effect, and least of all that part which established the exclusive trade to the colonies. Both the colonies and their trade were inconsiderable then, in comparison of what they are now. The island of Jamaica was an unwholesome desert, little inhabited and less cultivated. New York and New Jersey were in the possession of the Dutch, the half of St. Christopher's in that of the French. The island of Antigua, the two Carolinas, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Nova Scotia were not planted. Virginia, Maryland, and New England were planted, and though they were very thriving colonies, yet there was not perhaps at that time, either in Europe or America, a single person who foresaw, or even suspected, the rapid progress which they have since made in wealth, population, and improvement. The island of Barbados, in short, was the only British colony of any consequence, of which the condition at that time bore any resemblance to what it is at present. The trade of the colonies, of which England, even for some time after the act of navigation, enjoyed but a part, for the act of navigation was not very strictly executed till several years after it was enacted, could not at that time be the cause of the great trade of England, nor of the great naval power which was supported by that trade. The trade which at that time supported that great naval power was the trade of Europe, and of the countries which lie round the Mediterranean Sea. But the share which Great Britain at present enjoys of that trade could not support any such great naval power. Had the growing trade of the colonies been left free to all nations, whatever share of it might have fallen to Great Britain, 
and a very considerable share would probably have fallen to her, must have been all in addition to this great trade of which she was before in possession. In consequence of the monopoly, the increase of the colony trade has not so much occasioned an addition to the trade which Great Britain had before as a total change in its direction. Secondly, this monopoly has necessarily contributed to keep up the rate of profit in all the different branches of British trade, higher than it naturally would have been had all nations been allowed a free trade to the British colonies. The monopoly of the colony trade, as it necessarily drew towards that trade a greater proportion of the capital of Great Britain than what would have gone to it of its own accord, so, by the expulsion of all foreign capitals, it necessarily reduced the whole quantity of capital employed in that trade below what it naturally would have been in the case of a free trade. But, by lessening the competition of capitals in that branch of trade, it necessarily raised the rate of profit in that branch. By lessening, too, the competition of British capitals in all other branches of trade, it necessarily raised the rate of British profit in all those other branches. Whatever may have been, at any particular period since the establishment of the Act of Navigation, the state or extent of the mercantile capital of Great Britain, the monopoly of the colony trade must, during the continuance of that state, have raised the ordinary rate of British profit higher than it otherwise would have been, both in that and in all the other branches of British trade. If, since the establishment of the Act of Navigation, the ordinary rate of British profit has fallen considerably, as it certainly has, it must have fallen still lower, had not the monopoly established by that Act contributed to keep it up. But whatever raises in any country the ordinary rate of profit higher than it otherwise would be, necessarily subjects that country both to an absolute and to a relative disadvantage in every branch of trade of which she has not the monopoly. It subjects her to an absolute disadvantage, because, in such branches of trade, her merchants cannot get this greater profit without selling dearer than they otherwise would do, both the goods of foreign countries which they import into their own, and the goods of their own country which they export to foreign countries. Their own country must both buy dearer and sell dearer, must both buy less and sell less, must both enjoy less and produce less than she otherwise would do. It subjects her to a relative disadvantage, because, in such branches of trade, it sets other countries, which are not subject to the same absolute disadvantage, either more above her or less below her than they otherwise would be. It enables them both to enjoy more and to produce more, in proportion to what she enjoys and produces. It renders their superiority greater, or their inferiority less, than it otherwise would be. By raising the price of her produce above what it otherwise would be, it enables the merchants of other countries to undersell her in foreign markets, and thereby to jostle her out of almost all those branches of trade of which she has not the monopoly. Our merchants frequently complain of the high wages of British labor as the cause of their manufactures being undersold in foreign markets, but they are silent about the high profits of stock. They complain of the extravagant gain of other people, but they say nothing of their own. The high profits of British stock, however, may contribute towards raising the price of British manufactures, in many cases, as much, and in some perhaps more, than the high wages of British labor. It is in this manner that the capital of Great Britain, one may justly say, has partly been drawn and partly been driven from the greater part of the different branches of trade of which she has not the monopoly from the trade of Europe in particular, and from that of the countries which lie round the Mediterranean Sea. It has partly been drawn from those branches of trade, by the attraction of superior profit in the colony trade, in consequence of the continual increase of that trade, and of the continual insufficiency of the capital which had carried it on one year to carry it on the next. It has partly been driven from them, by the advantage which the high rate of profit established in Great Britain gives to other countries, and all the different branches of trade of which Great Britain has not the monopoly. As the monopoly of the colony trade has drawn from those other branches a part of the British capital, which would otherwise have been employed in them, so it has forced into them many foreign capitals which would never have gone to them, had they not been expelled from the colony trade. In those other branches of trade it has diminished the competition of British capitals, and thereby raised the rate of British profit higher than it otherwise would have been. 
On the contrary, it has increased the competition of foreign capitals, and thereby sunk the rate of foreign profit lower than it otherwise would have been. Both in the one way, and in the other, it must evidently have subjected Great Britain to a relative disadvantage in all those other branches of trade. The colony trade, however, it may perhaps be said, is more advantageous to Great Britain than any other, and the monopoly, by forcing into that trade a greater proportion of the capital of Great Britain than what would otherwise have gone to it, has turned that capital into an employment, more advantageous to the country than any other which it could have found. The most advantageous employment of any capital to the country to which it belongs is that which maintains there the greatest quantity of productive labor, and increases the most the annual produce of the land and labor of that country. But the quantity of productive labor which any capital employed in the foreign trade of consumption can maintain is exactly in proportion, it has been shown in the second book, to the frequency of its returns. A capital of a thousand pounds, for example, employed in a foreign trade of consumption, of which the returns are made regularly once in the year, can keep in constant employment, in the country to which it belongs, a quantity of productive labor equal to what a thousand pounds can maintain there for a year. If the returns are made twice or thrice in the year, it can keep in constant employment a quantity of productive labor equal to what two or three thousand pounds can maintain there for a year. A foreign trade of consumption carried on with a neighboring is, upon that account, in general, more advantageous than one carried on with a distant country. And, for the same reason, a direct foreign trade of consumption, as it has likewise been shown in the second book, is in general more advantageous than a roundabout one. But the monopoly of the colony trade, so far as it has operated upon the employment of the capital of Great Britain, has, in all cases, forced some part of it from a foreign trade of consumption carried on with a neighboring to one carried on with a more distant country and in many cases from a direct foreign trade of consumption to a roundabout one. First, the monopoly of the colony trade has, in all cases, forced some part of the capital of Great Britain from a foreign trade of consumption carried on with a neighboring to one carried on with a more distant country. It has, in all cases, forced some part of that capital from the trade with Europe and with the countries which lie round the Mediterranean Sea to that with the more distant regions of America and the West Indies, from which the returns are necessarily less frequent, not only on account of the greater distance, but on account of the peculiar circumstances of those countries. New colonies, it has already been observed, are always understocked. Their capital is always much less than what they could employ with great profit and advantage in the improvement and cultivation of their land. They have a constant demand, therefore, for more capital than they have of their own, and, in order to supply the deficiency of their own, they endeavor to borrow as much as they can of the mother country, to whom they are, therefore, always in debt. The most common way in which the colonies contract this debt is not by borrowing upon bond of the rich people of the mother country, though they sometimes do this too, but by running as much in arrear to their correspondents, who supply them with goods from Europe, as those correspondents will allow them. Their annual returns frequently do not amount to more than a third, and sometimes not to so great a proportion of what they owe. The whole capital, therefore, which their correspondents advance to them, is seldom returned to Britain in less than three, and sometimes not in less than four or five years. But a British capital of a thousand pounds, for example, which is returned to Great Britain only once in five years, can keep in constant employment only one-fifth part of the British industry which it could maintain, if the whole was returned once in the year. And, instead of the quantity of industry which a thousand pounds could maintain for a year, can keep in constant employment the quantity only which two hundred pounds can maintain for a year. The planter, no doubt, by the high price which he pays for the goods from Europe, by the interest upon the bills which he grants at distant dates, and by the commission upon the renewal of those which he grants at near dates, makes up, and probably more than makes up, all the loss which his correspondent can sustain by this delay. But, though he make up the loss of his correspondent, he cannot make up that of Great Britain. In a trade of which the returns are very distant, the profit of the merchant may be as great or greater than in one in which they are very frequent and near. But the advantage of the country in which he resides, the quantity of productive labor constantly maintained there, the annual produce of the land and labor, must always be less. 
that the returns of the trade to america and still more those of that to the west indies are in general not only more distant but more irregular and more uncertain too than those of the trade to any part of europe or even the countries which lie round the mediterranean sea will readily be allowed i imagine by everybody who has any experience of those different branches of trade secondly the monopoly of the colony trade has in many cases forced some part of the capital of great britain from a direct foreign trade of consumption into a roundabout one among the enumerated commodities which can be sent to no other market but great britain there are several of which the quantity exceeds very much the consumption of great britain and of which a part therefore must be exported to other countries but this cannot be done without forcing some part of the capital of great britain into a roundabout foreign trade of consumption maryland and virginia for example send annually to great britain upwards of ninety six thousand hogsheads of tobacco and the consumption of great britain is said not to exceed fourteen thousand upwards of eighty two thousand hogsheads therefore must be exported to other countries to france to holland and to the countries which lie round the baltic and mediterranean seas but that part of the capital of great britain which brings those eighty two thousand hogsheads to great britain which re-exports them from thence to those other countries and which brings back from those other countries to great britain either goods or money in return is employed in a roundabout foreign trade of consumption and is necessarily forced into this employment in order to dispose of this great surplus if we would compute in how many years the whole of this capital is likely to come back to great britain we must add to the distance of the american returns that of the returns from those other countries if in the direct foreign trade of consumption which we carry on with america the whole capital employed frequently does not come back in less than three or four years the whole capital employed in this roundabout one is not likely to come back in less than four or five if the one can keep in constant employment but a third or a fourth part of the domestic industry which could be maintained by a capital returned once in the year the other can keep in constant employment but a fourth or a fifth part of that industry at some of the outports a credit is commonly given to those foreign correspondents to whom they export their tobacco at the port of london indeed it is commonly sold for ready money the rule is way and pay at the port of london therefore the final returns of the whole roundabout trade are more distant than the returns from america by the time only which the goods may lie unsold in the warehouse where however they may sometimes lie long enough but had not the colony been confined to the market of great britain for the sale of their tobacco very little more of it would probably have come to us than what was necessary for the home consumption the goods which great britain purchases at present for her own consumption with the great surplus of tobacco which she exports to other countries she would in this case probably have purchased with the immediate produce of her own industry or with some part of her own manufactures that produce those manufacturers instead of being almost entirely suited to one great market as at present would probably have been fitted to a great number of smaller markets instead of one great roundabout foreign trade of consumption great britain would probably have carried on a great number of small direct foreign trades of the same kind on account of the frequency of the returns a part and probably but a small part perhaps not above a third or a fourth of the capital which at present carries on this great roundabout trade might have been sufficient to carry on all those small direct ones might have kept in constant employment an equal quantity of british industry and have equally supported the annual produce of the land and labour of great britain all the purposes of this trade being in this manner answered by a much smaller capital there would have been a large spare capital to apply to other purposes to improve the lands to increase the manufactures and to extend the commerce of great britain to come into competition at least with the other british capitals employed in all those different ways to reduce the rate of profit in them all and thereby to give to great britain in all of them a superiority over other countries still greater than what she at present enjoys the monopoly of the colony trade too has forced some part of the capital of great britain from all foreign trade of consumption to a carrying trade and consequently from supporting more or less the industry of great britain to be employed altogether in supporting partly that of the colonies and partly that of some other countries the goods for example which are annually purchased with a great surplus of eighty two thousand hogsheads of tobacco annually re-exported from great britain are not all consumed in great britain part of them 
linen from germany and holland for example is returned to the colonies for their particular consumption but that part of the capital of great britain which buys the tobacco with which this linen is afterwards bought is necessarily withdrawn from supporting the industry of great britain to be employed altogether in supporting partly that of the colonies and partly that of the particular countries who pay for this tobacco with the produce of their own industry End of Book 4, Chapter 7, Part D.